Welcome back to week 10 of becoming an electrician. This week, the training book started me off with, yeah, more health and safety. Can you believe it? More health and safety. And it's not just stuff like don't lick the wires. Okay, but getting into far more interesting stuff. Magnets, motors, and RMS. Magnets are everywhere. Magnetism is the key to all of our electric lives. The key to creating, moving and transforming our power. Magnetism is key to all of our motors too. And switching on and off devices and so much more. Magnetism can even power a fake free energy machine. Ooh. I started this week's material by looking at motors. DC motors feature in smaller devices from your phone's vibration feature to your electric toothbrushes as well as some big items too let me know in the comments if you've seen or know of a big type of dc motor they use a commutator to switch the electric field but i'll mainly be looking at ac motors today they use a switching ac current across two magnets or one magnet and a magnetic field with different polarities, the current provided to the pole induces an opposing magnetic field causing either the inner or the outer to rotate. Since the UK power grid is 50 Hz, this means that the magnetic field of an AC motor changes 100 times a second, which results in a set speed for induction motors depending on the number of poles. So the speed of this type of motor is governed by the frequency of the switching magnetic field and the number of magnetic fields. Quick pause. So I was confusing induction motors which tend to be used in industrial settings with universal motors which are the type that you find in all your appliances at home. These are the ones with commutators that can also run on DC. And back to the video. These sort of motors are found in kitchen appliances or say air conditioning units. Interestingly, there are many types of AC motors. An AC motor can be controlled with an inverter, which varies the speed and torque of the motor. Modern washing machines or air conditioning units, or even heat pumps use these type of motors to allow them to run in a more efficient level depending on the speed requirements. Say for example, a heat pump maintaining a temperature rather than getting up to temperature. The principles of motors providing a current to induce a magnetic field is the same principle that our generators work on. Instead of applying a current to induce the magnetic field, the rotating shaft in a generator creates a magnetic field which then creates a current. Generators are powered by all sorts of devices from water, wind, steam or petrol and diesel engines. These run on AC for our grids. Some reasons for using AC in our grids is it's often much easier to step up and down the voltage for transmission using transformers. As we learned in previous videos, higher voltages for transmission means lower current, so less heat for transmission and less energy lost. This step up and step down can be done with DC and it's how we operate our country's interconnections with other countries. But it just isn't as simple as the transformers that we have dotted all over the country. I'm sure that in a future video I'll be talking about these DC connections. Let me know in the comments below if you would like to see that. I looked at RMS which is the average voltage of an AC phase. Interestingly the voltage that we measure in a property, say for example in the UK 230 volts, is actually an RMS average or a root mean square. We can get the average by timesing the peak voltage by 0 0.707. Why is it 0 0.707? This value is the same as taking a peak value and dividing it by the square root of 2. Yeah, that's about as much as I understood on it too. So the main takeaway here is that the 230 volts is the average voltage. 
the peak voltage or maximum voltage is the greatest amount between the peak and trough of an AC sine wave. I'm sure that this will come in handy with calculations at a later stage. Next up, we have relays. You may be familiar with these already. They allow low power circuits to operate high powered circuits. Some examples in your home are a thermostat or smart plugs. In the most basic form, they're a little like a one way switch on a lighting circuit, but instead of a physical press, they rely on providing power to a coil, which effectively makes a magnetic field which pulls the contact together and creates a path for the electricity to flow on the main circuit. There's loads of different types, some normally open, some normally closed, some that latch or remain connected when the coil is no longer energized, some that don't. An electrician might use them in a DIN rail, for example, for delaying on or off a circuit. Say, for example, you had some lights in a car park. After you turn the switch off, you want time to get back to your car later you could use a relay with a time delay, so they might not go off for say 15 minutes. I've been familiar with relays through much smaller DC circuits. I've played with them for years, including with Arduinos and microcontrollers, for the reasons mentioned previously that you can control much higher power circuits with a simple microcontroller output. So to summarize in choosing the correct relay, there's many factors to take into account depending on the requirements such as the relay contact arrangement and rating and the coil voltage and whether it's rated for either AC or DC. I've quite enjoyed this week if you couldn't tell. A lot of what I've learned I had some interest in already. The hardest part of this week was to avoid waffling and believe me I feel like I've waffled. While this section of this book had a lot of information which I wanted to talk about and not skip over. So I think I'll just leave it there for this week. Next week we'll talk about transformers and get into some calculations. That's going to be fun to try and explain. Keep learning, Batrumano.